Hello, everyone. Can you hear? Yeah, it's on. But I'm not talking about it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The talk is out. Yes, sir. Try to. Hello. Can you hear me? Back. Okay. Thumbs up if you can hear him. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Apologies. Due to technical issues, we are only able to live stream the NRC competition uh, presentation. The other competitions will be recorded and will be will upload in short time in YouTube and in websites. So let's start with NRC competition. Yeah. Welcome everyone to UK sets launch event and national rocketry championship. Uh, Lamia Hamad, our uh, uh, NRC team vice lead, unfortunately could not make it today. So hence I'll be taking over. I'm Kiran Kumar, volunteer for NRC competitions and I'll be hosting today. And I'll give a brief uh, overview of the competition for this year. Uh, UK sets national rocket championship has been running for past nine years, making it UK sets oldest competition. Uh, the competition has grown significantly over the years with a record number of teams applying this year. Unfortunately, I couldn't say number, but I could say the number of teams applied for national rocket championship are more than 40 for sure. And uh, these are the past winners of the competitions. This year, the teams of the competition are to challenge students to perform a complex engineering task, provide them with hands-on experience, and allow them to uh, developing a technical skills and also, uh, also hopefully to give uh, some insight into propulsion, uh, propulsion as a potential career. The updates for the 10th edition of National Rocket Championship are this year, as uh, one of our colleagues said earlier, we are hosting a hub called uh, UK Sets uh, Community Hub. Uh, in the in the hub, we are, the teams will be all, allowed to discuss with mentors, or volunteers, and to submit their documents like technical reports and everything in the UK sets community hub. Uh, secondly, uh, we have increased the focus on project management. As you can see, we have uh, allotted a certain amount of points for project management this year. And also we are focusing on mentor and uh, workshops for this year. We also have strict uh, plagiarism checks for the competition and we have uh, allotted some, fund, uh, some funding for the evidence of project management and uh, outreach activities. The mission of this year's competition is, to, uh, is for students to design and build a mid-power rocket using any need to two grain 29 mm uh, Cetroni motor and to reach the uh, highest apogee as possible with the design. The competition consists of three phases. As you can see, we have design and build phase, launch phase, and group presentation phase. In design and build phase, the teams will research and then write a report that justifies the design choices and also demonstrate that uh, the rocket is safe to fly. And in launch phase, we have 
students will be building their rocket and they will launch a typically one of the amateur uh, rocketry groups in the country. As you can see, like, for example, we have uh, Midlands rocketry group or we have Cambridge uh, rocketry group. You can launch like any one of the amateur rocketry group across the country. And in presentation phase, we have teams will be submit their presentation that uh, outline their NRC journey, which they will present during the award day. The presentations are worth an extra uh, additional 60 points and will give an insight at uh, what team learned dur uh, during this journey of the NRC. And as I sp uh, spoke about uh, project management, this year the teams will also be judged on their project management skills. In additional, we have 30 points for uh, project management, which is split between design and build report and launch report. And the project management will be assessed on interaction between teams and mentors and meeting notes and uh, risk assessments, grant charts, and many more. And the project management is also an opportunity to gain for extra funding for the National Rocketry Championship. This year, the project, uh, the competition outline is we have the uh, rocket design and build phase, which is between December and January. We have design and build report submission, which will be around March to April. We have launch report submissions, which will be around June to July. And we finally, we have uh, NRC group presentation and award event, which will be around July to August. The specific the dates of the competition outline will be sent by email. Uh, the design and build report uh, submission deadline is confirmed and we, we will send by email everything and updates. But the uh, award ceremony dates are not confirmed yet, so we'll uh, update uh, everything by emails. This year, we have a total score of, out of 700 points. The, as you can see, this is a scoring table for National Rocketry Championship and the uh, major scores are divided for uh, site performance, payload, documentation and presentation. And we have uh, additional points for the creative payloads. And we also have uh, major points for the documentation of the reports. And as I say, you can see the additional uh, points for project management. We have 30 points and yeah, we have a scoring table. You can see on the left of your screen. Yeah. And this is the important segment of presentation. Uh, last year, teams were emerging from pandemic and we understand that even after the lockdown, there were new rules and regulation that needed uh, time to get used to. Hence, we decided to keep this year's competitions as same as last year's with some uh, newly added elements in order to give team a chance to improve on their previous rocket designs and uh, have a second chance after getting used to the new way of life. Uh, however, this does uh, does not mean that team should uh, should be submitting their rocket from previous competitions. We want to see Im improvement on the design and a new rocket built from scratch and the lessons learned previously. The teams will be disqualified if they fail to comply with following guidelines. The teams will be disqualified if they're using the same rocket as last year's or if they're using uh, payload hardware or custom printed PCBs as of last year designs. The teams will be disqualified if they're using the same code as uh, last year designs without any new advancements. And teams should be, uh, teams, uh, teams will be disqualified if they're using ready-made rocket points, uh, uh, sorry, rocket pa parts with no justifications. And there will be a reduction in uh, 
points if the teams are using same code as last years or if they are using uh, rocket made parts which uh, justification and the teams uh, teams will be having reduction in points if they are using uh, pcbs which are already uh, custom printed pcbs as of last years this year we have a lot of registration from same universities we have multiple teams from same universities and we have consider uh, plagiarism very seriously and these are the general guidelines of plagiarism teams shall not use same ha hardware from previous year design however basic ha hardware like raspberry pi arduino is allowed to use and they have to be disassembled and assembled from scratch and if the uh, teams uh, fail to comply penalty will be disqualifications or point reductions after review and team shall not use a similar design concept uh, hardware from previous or current year design without reasonable uh, justification if the team uh, fail to comply uh, the penalties will be disqualifications and point reductions after the review from the uk sets team and we have one more major guideline the report shall not include any copy text or diagrams from previous years documentations or external references if the pictures or the text are copied from external references they have to be cited in the report and it will also be considered as as plagiarism if they are not cited and general remarks on plagiarism or copying of external text will be still considered plagiarism unless the text is clearly quoted and the reference is cited uh, software advancement needs to be obvious in the sense that the software is capable of providing new valuables and data compared to the last year code if the design was deemed not sufficiently advanced by the markers and internal review process will occur to to decide whether the team will be deduction in points and or disqualified from the competition and diagrams of old report can can only be used in the case of comparison and advancements of evidence and reports are clearly mentioned that sorry and for mentoring uh, the role of this year mentors is to provide guidance feedback and support to teams by reviewing their designs for competitions and students uh, should be in charge in, uh, of keeping a uh, record of what is discussed in in the meeting using a minutes template with, which will be provided to you uh, by emails mentors should not directly contribute to the team's design but provide feedback on your ideas and work i advise you by uh, answering questions and uh and the mentors uh, are not supposed to be like expertise in a specific area uh, mentors are expected to share their experience and insight into uh, planning and executing the projects uh, in the space industry mentors are not required to work for the teams such request will be politely declined as I, as i said this year we have more than 40 teams registered for nrc competitions and 
compared to other UK sets competitions, the mentorship for NRC will be different. Uh, the mentorship for an NRC will operate like an open office hours. Mentors will be set like one to two hour online meeting of their platform choice. So the students can attend the online meeting and ask questions. This way we do not need to uh, assign 45 teams between the mentors and the volunteer will be present during the uh, uh, mentor meeting and they will be uh, monitoring the teams and they, and if two, uh, two teams joins the meeting at, at the same time, the team which will be joining first and they will be given a chance to ask first questions and we're also putting a community hub which mentors can use to interact with teams and uh, answer their questions. And we are putting a plagiarism uh, document. If a team oversees the idea of another team during the meeting and plagiarize their ideas, and we, we spot the similar designer co concept during the report, uh, UK sets will be interviewing and investigating whether the plagiarism has taken place. If the teams uh, found out that uh, plagiarism had uh, taken place, the teams will be disqualified. And we are working on the mentors rota for the year and we will be uh, forwarding it to all the teams by emails shortly. And this year we are conducting several workshops and uh, trainings. The first and upcoming workshop is on project management workshop. We have three sessions uh, running with uh, each session running for two hours and the number of ma maximum people per, per session is 20. And for project managers, we have first come first of base and the sign up links have been open from 1st of November. The sessions will be happening on 24th November and, and we are on 30th uh, November. And the list of more upcoming workshops and projects are here. We have system engineering workshop on November. The date of the workshops are not finalized yet and we'll be sending an email regarding all, all the workshops and trainings with specific dates and we have uh, space uh, safety and sustainability talks which will be happening in January and the dates are not finalized yet and we have several workshops for uh, as outreach workshop, business workshop and last round industry skill training which the dates are not finalized and we'll be sending the finalized dates with uh, more information through emails. Yeah, then thank you for everyone listening to the presentation. If you have any questions, you can mail us through the email I provided. And if you have any questions now, you can ask me. That's it for the, this is the overview of NRC competition for this year. Thank you for listening. Thank you. If you have any questions, you can ask. Oh, yeah. Yeah, regarding workshop, the uh, most of the workshop will be online. The uh, last workshop, which was regarding the last round workshop for the industry, it will be online and offline. It, it will be decided by the last round team that how many people can attend offline, how many people can like, attend online. So we will send an email regarding if it's on offline, you have to go to, I think, Westcott. They're in the Westcott, they have office where they will be showing all the uh, equipments and everything. So it will be de decided by the last round team. So they, they will inform us and we'll, we'll, we'll send a mail to everything. All right. Thank you. Any other question?
Ja. Ja. Uh, is it the same rocket or similar rocket? Yeah, the similar rockets are not considered plagiarism unless you use the same parts from the previous rocket. If you are building from scratch all the parts and if you have like justification that you are, you are making all designs by yourself and you are making one more new rocket from scratch, then it will be fine. If, if you are not using the same rocket as last year. Yeah. You just need to provide like justification like whoa, why you are using the same design and what, what are the reasons to be used. So it will be fine if you are using. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, after this, we'll be having a short break. And after the break, we have mentors introduction. So we'll be in introducing all the mentors who are currently offline and who, are, who will be joining us with uh, online. Uh, it will be like maybe after 15 minutes after the break. Yeah. Then past three hours, we'll, we'll check on the other presentation. If they're over, we'll start with the introduction. Thank you. Thank you for joining.
Hello everyone. I hope all hope you found the competition's um, talks really informative and um, you've got an idea now of what the brief is for this year. Can everyone hear me? Cool. Okay. We're now going to do the mentor introduction. So we're going to go through the mentors who are here today and uh, talk a bit about their background and experience they have um, uh, from their career. So the first mentor we have is Josh Finn. He is a mentor for SDC and OIT. He's currently a graduate engineer at Dallas. His expertise lies in social engineering and his career highlights include uh, being co-founder of Astrofirst. Next up, we have Andrew Davis. So he's currently the CEO of the UK Space Consultancy, EYSC PLC. He's, he's going to be a mentor for the satellite design competition and has expertise in astronomy, satellite systems, and business support. His career highlights include um, working with ESA, the EU, UK MOD, and companies such as Tyus, Airbus, and Lockheed, and Northrop. Yeah, so next we have Paul Boyd. Burardi, I hope I pronounced that correctly. He is going to be a mentor for NRC. His expertise lies in, lie in rocketry, satellites, um, currently, I think, active debris removal missions. And his career highlights include uh, leading uh, the Francis team, the 2021 Europe team, and mentoring the 2022 edition. So next is Chris Moffat. He's a, a senior project assurance engineer at OIP Space Systems, and he'll be mentor for ORT. He has experience in project assurance and space instruments and has worked on projects such as the ExoMars rover with Airbus and the Altius uh, mission for ESA. Um, next, we have David Gilmore. His current role our president and CEO at Capsad, board member at Mithri Global and our prospect. He's going to be mentoring SDC. Uh, his expertise lie in international satellite comms, project management, and his career highlights include working on Marconi Worked, working with um, Marconi, East British Aerospace, and Deputy CEO of the North Satellite, and consultant and international. Next up is Tatiana Kretcher. So she's current, she currently provides project management for Airbus, and she'll be a um, mentor for satellite design competition. She has the expertise in satellite systems, project planning and management, and space engineering. And as part of her previous work, she's researched smart manufacturing for future constellations for ESA. Um, then we have Diana Matthew, who will be um, guiding us online. Her current role is Space Applications Engineer at ESA. She's going to be mentoring for STC. Her expertise is in telecoms, satcoms engineering, project management, and RF engineering. Her career highlights include project managing R&D and innovation projects using space assets for applications and services for various sectors. Next is Phil, Phil Moy, um, and he currently is a visiting lecturer on rocket and space technologies at the University of Hertfordshire, and he'll be mentor for the NRC. Has expertise in engineering quality management, rocketry, and space technologies. His career highlights include being the safety manager for Beagle 2 for ESA and chief engineer on Skynet, Skynet 5 for the UK MOD. Uh, then we have Chris Brown, who's currently a design engineer. He's mentoring Mac 33. Uh, he's expert design in rocketry, RSO, physics, and electronic system engineering. And his career highlights include working on flying Robin Space Shuttle for Top Gear, um, involved and also involved with UKRA PPS scheme. Next is Ray Wilkinson. So he's currently a visiting lecturer on aerospace at Highland Studies, also at the University of Hertfordshire, and he'll be mentor for the NRC. He has expertise in rocketry, aerospace engineering, including rocket propulsion and pilot studies. And his former career highlights include um, being a member of the East Anglian Rocketry Society, um, build, building a rocket that flew at, uh, with a level three attempt, being over 12 feet long, and being powered by RATT, RATT works. M900 hybrid motors. He's also been involved in TV productions, um, such as being a rocketry specialist on Richard Hammond's Blast Lab. Um, next, we have Tim Cole. He's currently a senior program manager at Astro Digital. He's going to be mentoring SDC. His expertise is currently in uh, managing assembly, integration, and test of space systems and subsystems. His career highlights include managing the power propulsion element of the deep space at gateway for NASA, cost estimation uh, for design development, manufacturing, and SENI. <laughs> For new SC boss. 
So Thea Grimm is a mentor for the NRC and he's worked on industrial means for air best friends in space. Um, he has expertise in engineering design competitions, processes and equipment to enable satellite manufacturing. And his career highlights include being the technical director for the for former student team. Um, I think last we have Grant Gibson, his current role is a materials and costing engineer at Rolls Royce. He's, he'll be mentoring for NFC. His expertise lie in modern rocketry, drones, and manufacturing, high temperature proteins for um, environmental protection. His career highlights include Rolls Royce lead ambassador, helping schools set Guinness World Records for rocket powered cars as um, part of the Bloodhound SSC project. Personally, uh, manufactured 500 face visors for benches during the pandemic. And those are all the mentors that will be joining us today, both in person and online. Okay. <laughs> okay, so for meeting your mentors today, what we'll be doing, um, we'll be basically doing speed networking where some teams will have to, um, we'll have a certain amount of time to meet with some mentors and then basically rotate it around. We're probably going to do them in the big conference that we had. Um, we'll talk more about that after the Airbus talk. So yeah, I think that's all for the mentor introduction. So next we'll be having a talk from Kieran Jenkins who works at Airbus and he'll be explaining a bit more about what Airbus do and the career opportunities there. Do you know probably put this oh, yeah, in full screen? Uh, I think we can watch the maybe if you press the last one. I don't know. Um maybe I'll then. Then, yeah, that's that. There you go. That's that. Should be live. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Cool. Um, so I will hopefully can hear me okay, and um, those who are dialed in can as well. Um, but yeah, so my name is Keen Jenkins. Um, I work at Airbus Defence and Space in the UK, um, and I'm delighted to be here with all of you today. And I'm going to try and convince you that. Um, what you're all doing by participating in the UK SEDS uh, competitions this year are going to prepare you to have a great um, career in the space industry, if you would like to. 
Um, so yeah. Change on to the next slide. There we go. Okay, yeah, so I'm going to give you just a quick overview of Airbus as an organisation. Uh, I'll introduce myself uh, a bit more as well and, and what I do. Um, and hopefully at the end, try and give you some, some tips and tricks uh, for competitions that you're entering this year. Uh, so just yeah, a quick introduction to myself. Um, so I studied uh, at the University of Strathclyde. Um, make sure to learn that I'm Scottish. Um, <laughs> I studied a degree in aeromechanical engineering. Um, and yeah, some of the things that I've been uh, proud to do so far in, in my um, early career is while I was still at university, I actually founded an organisation called Strathface, the Strathclyde Aerospace Innovation Society. Uh, which some of you may or may not have heard of, and that meant that I was really heavily involved with uh, student competitions and projects, which I'll come on to talk about in a bit more detail later on, including the UK SEDS competitions. Um, and the best thing that I did uh, while still at university was working on a project called Strathcube, which was our university's first uh, student-led CubeSat initiative. Um, and we were fortunate to present the research that we did for that project um, at the International Astronautical Congress in Dubai uh, uh, last year. Um, fortunately, I also got to, while well, still at uni, um, do a space placement in, inter in industry or a spin internship um, at a UK startup. So that's a scheme that's run by the UK Space Agency and Satellite Applications Catapult. And that was my first kind of professional experience working in the space industry. Um, yeah, I also got to study abroad at um, Georgia Tech in the States, which is a pretty incredible place for aerospace engineering and all things space. Uh, so that was that was really cool. Um, yeah, in terms of what I do at Airbus, so I'm a, a spacecraft systems engineer in the Earth Observation and Science Department, uh, Chief Engineering. Um, so, you know, some really exciting missions such as um, Solar Orbiter, which some of you may have heard of, which launched um, a couple of years ago, or more recently, that you might have seen in the news recently, a mission called Biomass, um, the, basically the technical authorities for those projects, so the chief engineers, um, they operate out of the same department, which is pretty cool. And my job is basically supporting um, supporting them to perform systems engineering activities. I'm going to change the slide. There we go. Okay, yeah, so a very brief introduction to Airbus. I'd imagine um, quite a few of you will have heard of Airbus. Um, because it's the largest um, aerospace company in Europe, basically, and we have three different divisions. So what we're most famous for is typically seen as our commercial aircraft. So if you've ever been in a flight before, there's a very good chance that you've been in an Airbus aircraft. Um, we have helicopters as well, which people know a bit less about. Um, and then what people probably associate Airbus with even less is our, our defence and specifically our space division. Um, which I guess is why we're here today and why we take such great interest in the UK SEDS competitions. Um, and just to highlight some pretty staggering numbers there, um, which don't really mean a whole lot. I mean, they do, but yeah, just it's a big company, basically. Um, slightly more tangible and interesting is what Airbus does in the UK. And um, so the UK is seen as um, a real priority for Airbus. It's one of the four um, home nations, along with France, Germany, and Spain. Um, and we have quite a lot of space capabilities in particular um, in the UK. That's one of our big areas of focus. Um, and yeah, we, we add an awful lot of value to the UK uh, economy and generally things like research, and development, technology. Um, there's a you know a huge number of projects which are um, impacted by Airbus positively in the UK. Yeah, so just to give you an overview of um, some of the sorts of things that we work on, work on specifically in Airbus, uh, the space division. Um, so one of the things that we've done traditionally for the last at least 30 years is work on telecommunication satellites. So a good fun fact is if you've ever watched Sky TV in the UK, we've used an Airbus product um, that was coming through Airbus Stevenage, which is where I work. Um, at some point or another, as I've already mentioned, we do things like Earth observation satellites, um, and then some of the more glamorous ones like exploration missions to Jupiter through the JUICE mission. Um, not done so much out of the UK, but another really cool one is the Artemis missions, which you've heard of, I'm sure, 
for space enthusiasts, which many of you are in the room. Um, so what's sitting on top of the NASA SLS at the moment, the Orion spacecraft. So Airbus in Germany um, designed the and built the uh, service module for that, which is a you know kind of major critical element of the spacecraft, providing things like life support systems and thermal control to the astronauts on board, which is pretty important. Um, and yeah, we also do things like launchers. So the Ariane Group, um, Airbus is a, um, you know, owns jointly with Safran. So um, yeah, the launchers out of uh, Crew, for example, are, are um, done by uh, an Airbus owned company, Ariane, which is pretty cool. So basically the message is, yeah, I've got a vast portfolio of um, projects. Um, and as, yeah, the biggest, biggest space company in, in the UK and Europe, um, then yeah, it's, it's, it's a really interesting, um, there's a really interesting array of things that uh, you can get involved in. Yep, so I've touched on this already, but just to, to um, reiterate the point of some of the things that we do and all the different domains that we work in, so as well as the kind of space systems aspects in the UK, we have a lot of influence on things like intelligence and cyber, uh, down in, our site in Newport, for example. Um, so we do quite a lot with defence customers as well. Um, so I flashed up earlier about uh, Skynet, for example, so the British military uh, satellite network that's um, been done in uh, Airbus Defence and Space for, from, and what it was previously for, for many, many years. Uh, we also have projects such as the Zephyr project, which is pretty cool. So that's a, a high altitude pseudo satellite. So kind of a, a UAV or a UAS system, which goes at about 20,000 odd feet um, and is, is pretty novel. So that's done in Farnborough in the UK as well. Yeah, so I just wanted to touch on um, a few of the projects that I thought were especially interesting um, and, and relevant to some of the things that I work on as well, so I can, I can give a bit of insight into. Um, so one thing that Airbus is heavily involved in is the kind of growth of um, using smaller satellites um, in Constellation. So this is quite relevant to uh, the satellite design competition, guys. Uh, so many of you probably have heard of OneWeb. Um, and what they're trying to do is provide similar to things that you may have heard of as well, like Starlink, trying to provide more global communications coverage through a constellation of smaller satellites. Um, but what this means is what we're doing within the space industry is um, trying to come up with different ways of satellite manufacture. So trying to do them in a much more mass on mass way, more analogous to something like the automotive industry. Uh, whereas previously, and you know, we still do do this, we do a lot of things for science missions, for example. It's very bespoke. It takes a very long time. Things like an ESA mission can take, you know, at least 10, 15 years. There's a famous story about the, you know, the James Webb telescope, which launched last year. Uh, people have been working on that since about the 1990s, and people had the idea for it since about the 19, I think, 70s or something. Um, so what we're trying to do now is also adapt to... Uh, trends in the space industry, such as, um, well, things like the cube, you know, CubeSat revolution and space industry becoming smaller and uh, taking advantage of the more powerful um, processing power, for example. Uh, so, I, yeah, fortunately, a couple of weeks ago, one of the pro due to one of the projects I worked on, I got to go and see the final assembly line for the OneWeb satellites in Toulouse, which was really cool. Um, so, yeah, just giving you an idea of some of the things that we do. Uh, one that's more relevant to, or extremely relevant to the UK, I don't know, I suppose it's going to change. Um, one of the projects we worked on a couple of years ago, which launched, uh, it's called Solar Orbiter. Um, so this is a spacecraft that is currently taking it's like the most detailed um, pictures of the sun ever, uh, and specifically going over the poles of the poles of the sun for the very first time. So this was a huge um, project with our work in Airbus Stevenage. And I'm highlighting it because uh, a lot of the people that I work with on my team um, worked on this project, and it's quite it's quite relevant to the project that I'm presently working on. Um, so yeah, pretty fascinating piece of um, feat of engineering here. Really, you know, it's an incredibly challenging problem to try and get so close to the sun and use highly complex instruments to take some pretty incredible pictures of it. So yeah, I'd, I definitely recommend trying to have a look online. Um, for ESA's solar orbiter and try and see some of the data that it comes up with because it's pretty, it's pretty incredible. And then next, something else that I think has already been highlighted today as well, uh, and again is very relevant to 
UK SEDS competitions. So also um, within your bus in the UK, we developed the ExMars rover mission, um, which is not going to launch in 2022. Unfortunately, that is due to the conflict between um, Russia and Ukraine, unfortunately. So as we, this is a joint mission with Roscosmos, um, and we are yeah, officially no longer cooperating with Roscosmos. So unfortunately, that means that this rover is more likely to launch than roughly 2028 now. Um, but excitingly, it means that there's a good chance that we're going to develop in the UK um, Mars lander technologies ourselves in-house, which currently no one can do in Europe. So again, just goes to show that there's some pretty exciting things that happen um, in the UK that you may or may not be aware of. And, and yeah, these are all down near us. So you can see that um, what you can see in the picture there is our Mars Yard facility, which we have in Stevenage. So actually the Olympus Rover Trials, the, the UK SEDS competition, we host there. So, so we hosted it there last year for the very first time. So we've got some really cool pictures of the teams that participated last year. I was there personally, and yeah, it was a fantastic day for all involved. And we're doing the same again this year. So for those of you participating in the ORT, it's a pretty cool thing to do is come and see where we test our Mars rovers and the teams on the day actually got to see a demo of some of the rovers working in the end as well. Um, one cool thing to highlight of some of our facilities is we've got in Stevenage something called the BioClean Room. So uh, that's the BioClean facility. And that's, again, one of the only places in the world which is um, high enough grade and, and cleanliness to basically build things that can go to Mars. The reason being that there's really strict laws on planetary protection, so you don't want to have any microbes or, you know, um, life forms that could impact another planet. So, yeah, just an overview there of some of the really cool and interesting things that we work on um, in Airbus UK. So, yeah, so just wanted to try to translate that a little bit into what that looks like for um, a day in the life for someone like myself. So what I do at the moment is work a lot on a project called Vigil, um, which is a mission to uh, monitor the sun's activities from a unique vantage point, a Lagrange point five, um, which you can see there. So essentially it observes the Earth's sun system from the side on and using some really complex and interesting um, scientific instruments, very similar to solar, the ones that are on Solar Orbiter. Um, we try and monitor different parts of the sun to, in advance, provide this continuous communication system to the Earth to warn of things like solar flares happening. So this is going to um, launch in 2029. Um, and yeah, it's, it's got some incredible engineering challenges uh, involved in it there. So what, what I do specifically, so just to, to kind of give you an idea of the sorts of things I might do, as systems engineer is um, I work quite a lot with the um, subcontractors who design these really complex scientific instruments. And a lot about being a systems engineer is trying to understand or provide requirements to them such that they will work with our spacecraft and try to understand their design well enough to check things are compatible, have conversations with them to try and communicate and, and manage those interfaces well together to make sure that you know, their design is compatible with our spacecraft and, and vice versa, which, it, you know, leads to some quite interesting technical challenges as well as programmatic challenges like impacts on cost and schedule and risk. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a very communication-focused role. Uh, so I like to I like to talk. And um, what that means is rather than solving, you know, having an in-depth knowledge of any one subsystem like mechanical or thermal, electrical, um, I basically need to know who to who to ask. So it's kind of a master of, uh, um, you know, I thought the phrase has gone out of my head. But uh, jack of all trades, master of none is what I'm looking for. Um, so yeah, so it's a lot of interfacing with different architects of the spacecraft and trying to understand, you know, bring them technical issues and then working together to try and um, solve them. So yeah, as I've already mentioned, quite a lot of my roles focused on doing things like requirements writing and management. Um, and yeah, again, a lot of cooperation and teamwork um, with the general systems engineering team. Something else that's quite relevant to the UK SEDS competition is um, do quite a lot to do with updating of engineering budgets, so keeping track of things like mass and power, which you know critical. Um, I think it's one to launch one extra kilogram on a satellite costs ten thousand dollars. So yeah, trying to really make sure that. And we stay within the constraints of something like a launch vehicle is very important. Um, and something else that I'm able to do within my role of 
uh, within my role at Airbus is I'm actually the chair of uh, an organization called Unicom. So that stands for Universities Careers and Outreach Management. And we are the organization that does things like provide sponsorship to the UK SEDS competitions. So yeah, that's why I get to be involved in things like the uh, Rules Committee for the SDC or help to do things like plan and facilitate the Limps Rover trials come to Stevenage and organize things like the sponsorship of that, which is, yeah, a really rewarding part of my job and something that I enjoy very much. So yeah, aside from all the technical um, day job stuff, then yeah, it's very rewarding to be here today, for example, and perform outreach activities with students. Um, so yeah, just coming on to the end then, I just wanted to highlight why um, the UK SEDS competitions, um, how participating in things such as that during my time at university and the stage that you're all at, which wasn't so long ago, um, how that helped prepare me for a career in the space industry. So yeah, again, as I mentioned earlier, so I founded um, Strathclyde Aerospace Innovation Society, um, which for example, last year won the, not me, but they won the UK SEDS SDC last year. Um, I also, yeah, again, worked on Strathcube, which is a, a student cube set for sustainable uh, usage of space. Um, and I just wanted to emphasize that the lessons that I learned, particularly through, through those two projects, um, were incredibly translatable to the role that I have now. Um, so I mentioned, you know, keeping a track of things like mass and power budgets um, for um, ESA vigil mission. So a few years ago then, I remember doing that for a four kilogram 3U CubeSat and trying to monitor the mass and apply design margins to components of only a couple hundred grams. I now I'm in charge of managing the same engineering budgets for a 2,500 kilogram spacecraft, which will go 150 million kilometers away. And believe it or not, they're actually not so different. I was a bit shocked to see that it's just, it's just the same sort of Excel spreadsheet. And it really is all based on Kind of engineering design decisions, communicating with the correct technical members of the team and trying to understand, I guess, where the design drivers are. And actually the mindset of doing it, that you learn, you learn in doing things like these competitions really is very translatable to what it's actually like in industry, which I think is really cool. Um, and yeah, through my, through my role doing these two things, I then mentored a team through um, the STC a couple of years ago. Um, who managed to come second, which was really cool. So our approach was to use the UK SEDS competitions to kind of train up in particular um, less experienced students or younger members who have maybe not had, you know, very much experience with space engineering whatsoever. Um, and yeah, through doing such competition, then they started from nothing basically to being able to produce quite an impressive design. They managed to come second in the competition as highlighted there. And then actually, you know, I'll, many of the same team last year although I wasn't involved, they then won the competition last year. Um, and yet to highlight again, so there's, you know, myself, I work at Airbus now, and many members of that team have actually got on to work in the space industry. So companies like Clyde Space in Glasgow, um, Spire also in Glasgow. Um, so yeah, so just to try and convince you that by doing these competitions, there's a huge amount to gain from them. And I, you know, I can recommend doing them enough for your prospects if you're interested in working in the career, uh, space industry. Yeah, just to finish, just I can't, what I consider is my five top tips for those kicking off um, doing these competitions this year. Uh, the first is, it's the same thing really, that you will get out of it what you put in. So um, yeah, don't try to yeah, there's no, there's no shortcuts, unfortunately, it, is, it can be quite a lot of work at times, but you will get massive rewards out of it for the end, at the end if you do. Um, the UK SEDS guys are fantastic at, you know, supporting you throughout the, uh, supporting you throughout the year. They always give you encouragement. Uh, I wouldn't be scared to try to do something. You, you know, you'll never, um, that'll never be detrimental to you to try something new and innovative. Um, and ultimately, I've never seen or heard of a team that's not worked really hard, that's not got a lot out of it at the end, even if, you know, they don't win or something like that, doesn't, doesn't matter. It's, it's the kind of learning experience that matters. Um, same as in any project, to be honest, whether it's an ANISA project or something different, um, for the UK SEDS competitions, communication is key, so talk to one another. Uh, don't just do everything in a silo or, uh, you know, have your head down and only work on your piece of code or orbital analysis that you're working on at any given time. Try also to, 
yeah, communicate with one another and try to understand the bigger picture, which kind of ties in with my third approach. Um, I would say this as someone who's done systems engineering for uh, quite often now, um, but yeah, try to follow this approach. You know, you can't have one person who's designing a structure that's totally incompatible with the thermal design or the AOCS system or something like that. You do really need to control as a team what you're trying to achieve together. And again, this, you know, ties very much in with communication. Um, the next one, which is a bit, a bit different, is try and start thinking about how you're going to build something early. So that's something that I'm really interested in in my day-to-day -day role is when we're working on earlier phases of projects, trying to communicate with people who regularly build things and test them and um, trying to you know, go down and see the facilities and get close and up close to hardware to try and understand what the different constraints are of um, handling things from a logistical perspective. And there's many things that you won't think of. So yeah, I'd recommend try not to stay too theoretical and the UK side guys are, are very good at this. Try and not stay too theoretical and think ahead about how you're actually going to build the thing and start prototyping as early as you can. Um, and yeah, and lastly, feel free to you know come and chat to us, whether it's uh, your ment this fantastic panel of mentors we had described moments ago, um, talking with the team in UK SEDS in general, or people in industry such as myself, please yeah, try to engage with them. Don't be shy. Um, if you ever need to drop anyone an email, then I'm sure they'll be more than happy to help you out. Yeah, so that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Hopefully that gave you an interesting overview to your bus, uh, a bit about myself and what we can do to help you with the UK's head of competitions this year. So yeah, thanks very much. I don't know if there's time for questions, Holly, or whatever. Do you want a question? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll I'll be I'll be honest. That's yeah. Not not strictly, totally factually accurate. Not really. <laughs> but I didn't want to scare people by saying yeah. Working at Airbus, you're actually going to be at like seven till seven, which is a bit more realistic to be honest. But yeah, so it's a very good observation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Um, I'd say, to be honest, there's a lot of translate. So the, the question was about the differences between electronics on a spacecraft versus an aircraft. Um, to be honest, there's a lot of things that are very specific to space um, and the kind of protocols we use and so on. Um, However, I'd say generally there's a lot of uh, translatable skills, even if things like the hardware or protocols are quite different. I myself, I'm not an electronics engineer, but I have to speak to them quite often. And I know one, one guy who I speak to very regularly uh, and is very senior. Oh. Yeah, he, he previously worked as an electronics engineer on military aircraft and he transitioned over to space. So it's, it's very doable. Yeah. Hello. Did you purposely decide to go? Yeah, that's no, a good question and one I debate myself with myself sometimes as well. Um, so I think, so when I was doing student projects, then I ended up being like the like team leader and as a result, kind of systems engineer, if you like. So it was not doing, you know, any one particular bit of analysis, although I did do a bit of that on the side. Um, and I just really enjoyed talking to, I just really enjoyed talking to different people and trying having a higher level I guess, understanding of overall a mission and its objectives. Um, so yeah, when I finished in uni, given how much I enjoyed that, I knew that that's exactly what I wanted to do is systems engineering. 